All right. You guys ready for module four? Last one. All right, so this one we're going to talk about isoform discovery and alternative expression. It kind of builds naturally on a lot of the stuff that you've already been doing with cufflinks. Uh, mostly what we're going to be doing is rerunning uh, some of the types of commands you are already running in cufflinks, but with slightly different options that are more geared towards isoform, quantification, and discovery. Uh, so some of the learning objectives of this, the tutorial that goes along with this lecture uh, are Actually, sorry, I've got the wrong presentation here. Uh, basically, we're going to use cufflinks in what's sometimes called a reference annotation based transcript assembly mode or RABT mode. <coughs> And also it's a de novo assembly mode. So in, so far we've been running cufflinks with a GTF file that provides uh, an idea of what the transcriptome already looks like. And we've been basically asking cufflinks to really take that model of the transcriptome very seriously and to estimate expression for the transcripts that are described in the GTF file that we specify. Now we're going to run cufflinks in two additional modes. One where we tell cufflinks to basically just use that transcriptome as a loose guide. So to try to use the information there but not be totally beholden to it. Uh, and another mode where we don't tell it anything about the transcriptome. So we could be studying uh, a species where we didn't even have any transcript uh, annotations at all. Uh, and it's going to just try to assemble the transcriptome that it thinks uh, is expressed in your RNA-seq sample uh, without any prior knowledge of what the transcripts uh, look like. So this is a slide, uh, just a review from the first presentation. Uh, so remember we talked through this idea of the, the central dogma where we have information flowing from a double-stranded genomic DNA template to a single-stranded pre-mRNA molecule where the introns are uh, in place. Uh, between exons and then the splicing machinery comes along and removes the introns and assembles the exons. Again, this is mostly uh, applicable to eukaryotes. Uh, and then this thing uh, gets exported from the nucleus to the cytoplasm uh, where it gets translated into a protein sequence that is then folded uh, and various uh, post-translational modifications occur. So what we're going to be really thinking about now uh, is uh, the way these uh, mature mRNAs are structured and how there can be different versions of uh, isoforms being expressed from each locus. And those versions come about by differences in the way splicing happens. So you have a splicing machinery that comes along, it recognizes signals uh, on the pre-mRNA molecule and it removes the introns. But for basically every human gene there are multiple ways that that happens. Uh, and there's a very complex regulatory system that controls exactly which isoforms are expressed uh, from which lo loci. Uh, and this is a really active uh, and deep area of research in uh, various species, uh, especially the mammals. So this slide is really just to illustrate uh, that there's a lot of complexity to the analysis of uh, RNA-seq data with respect to splicing. So I got this slide from the RNA-seq blog. Uh, which you haven't, if you haven't checked out already, I highly recommend it. Uh, this blog does a pretty good job of keeping on top of the latest developments in RNA-seq uh, technology and analysis. Uh, and there will often be reviews of new tools that have come out or collections of different tools for different types of analyses. Uh, and this is actually from a sort of pre-proof uh, manuscript that the author of this blog seemed to be writing uh, where there, he's listed uh, a variety of tools for different types of RNA-seq analysis, uh, starting with mapping, so there's various mappers that are used for RNA-seq data, uh, reconstruction of isoforms, um, and then quantification of isoforms, uh, and then uh, ultimately comparison of different conditions, so different differential expression analysis, uh, and there's lots of things that kind of fit into multiple categories uh, <coughs> or span across those boundaries. Uh, the next slide is also kind of just meant as a resource, so it's a, a list of 
some useful resources and dis discussion that I've found over the last few years, uh, starting with a discussion of best approaches for predicting novel and alternative splicing events from RNA-seq data. So there's a couple of Biostars posts. So we've mentioned this forum a couple times. Again, if you haven't signed up for a Biostars account, you should do that, and you should in the future, when you have questions after you go home from this tutorial uh, and you have questions about RNA-seq, that would be the first place I would check. Uh, search for the topic area of your question. Maybe spend 5 or 10 or 15 minutes doing that. If you don't see uh, a question that seems relevant uh, or the questions there don't have the answers that you need, uh, then go ahead and ask the question um, that you have there. And <clears throat> there's a pretty uh, active community of bioinformatics folks that uh, are involved in Biostars and you'll often get some really useful feedback and answers to uh, questions. <coughs> uh, a couple more posts that are really relevant to this topic on alternative splicing detection are listed here. Uh, there's an interesting post on identifying genes that express different isoforms in cancer versus normal RNA-seq. Uh, some discussion of how cufflinks and cuff diff uh, differ and what they're doing. Uh, and then a, a discussion of tools that you might use for visualizing alternative splicing events from RNA-seq data. Uh, to help us think about uh, both the types of events that we're going to be looking at and the way to visualize them, there's a couple slides here uh, in its sort of cartoon depictions of the types of alternative expression that occur. So the first uh, example at the top here is just simple transcription. So this is just a reciprocation of what I showed on the, the central dogma slide. Uh, showing uh, a simple gene with three exons and two introns uh, and it's being spliced into what uh, is called the canonical isoform which is usually a reference to the most common or representative isoform that's expressed from a particular locus. Uh, and then there are a variety of other uh, of categories in which uh, transcription can happen differently. So for example alternative transcript initiation is where the tran uh, transcriptional complex sits down in different places and starts uh, to transcribe uh, at one position uh, but may also do it at another position. So for example, we have two transcription start sites being depicted here uh, and these could lead to two isoforms that differ by having basically a different first exon. Uh, so we get three exons uh, and then another transcript that has the same exons except it starts at the second exon uh, and does not use the first exon. <coughs> Alternative splicing is sort of a loose uh, term to describe stuff that happens sort of in the middle of the transcript, uh, and there's a variety of subtypes of alternative splicing. Uh, so something that's called cassette exon skipping is where you have two isoforms that differ by the, the exons that they include. So in the first example, we have our canonical uh, isoform with exons one, two, and three. Uh, and then we have an alternative ex uh, transcript where uh, exon 2 has been skipped. Uh, you can also have alternative 5' prime splice site usage. Uh, so in this case, uh, the 5' prime of the, and the, in this case is the splice site is referring to the 5' prime uh, of the intron. Um, so you've got two alternative uh, ends to this exon basically. Uh, so basically what's happening is the splicing machinery is coming along and it's deciding to use uh, this donor site or this donor site. Uh, and this gives you slightly different uh, mature mRNA transcripts, uh, in this case with a, a longer or shorter exon 2. Similarly, you can have alternative 3' prime splice sites. So these are where you have an alternate uh, acceptor site being used. Uh, and again, this gives you isoforms that uh, differ slightly in their length. Uh, in this case, you've got a, a short exon 3 being used and a longer exon 3 being used in the alternative isoform. Mutually exclusive exon usage is very similar to the cassette exon usage, except in this case, you've got, you're going to produce two uh, isoforms, each with th three exons being used, but the center or second exon used is different between the two of them. So you have sort of an exon 2A and an exon 2B. Um, and then finally you can have intron retention where you have the basic scenario where you have exon 1, 2, and 3 joined together and then another scenario where instead of exon 1, 2, 3 you have exon 1 spliced to 2 whoops, and then the entire intron is included and it continues on to exon 3 so effectively you just have a really long exon 2 here. Yeah. Uh, 
in the case that like you have an intron, but the intron like hosts for like mic RNA, you're gonna get a bunch of reads in that intron, but they don't actually map to a transcript like this. Will it will it try to create that transcript? Yeah, so you're saying you, yeah, you have basically an, an alternate gene inside another gene. Well, yeah, like a lot of microRNAs are from introns, right? So the intron yeah. comes out, it gets cleaved into a precursor of microRNA. So you're going to get tons of reads from that precursor microRNA, assuming that you didn't do a polyase selection. And then is this going to try to map that as an alternative transcript? Because it's actually <coughs> sort of a separate unit. Yeah, so it is possible that that kind of thing could happen. Um, if you have stranded information, often these kind of events are at least happening on the alternate strand, which is helpful. If things like that are happening on the same strand, it's off, it can be very confusing to deconvolute what's going on. Um, the good news is that um, those things often tend to be sort of single exon of events that are within an intron, so there won't be evidence for them being connected to the, uh, the exons on either side, so you can use that information to try to tell which of them kind of go with the, the five or ten exon gene that's being expressed and which of them are maybe a, a separate transcriptional unit within the intron. But yes, it's possible that you could have sort of confusing situations like that where you inadvertently assemble a sort of chimeric or Frankenstein isoform that isn't really real. Uh, and that kind of all comes back to this this sort of caveat or warning that you have to yeah, always remember that we're inferring a lot of things here and sometimes you can put the pieces of the puzzle together wrong and it looks reasonable but you actually have a misrepresentation. <clears throat> and hopefully you would be able to sort that out in some kind of downstream validation before you went too crazy doing functional work on this thing that you think exists but is really uh, kind of a misunderstanding of the data. Any other questions? Uh, so this slide is uh, just a kind of a quick summary of uh, some of the history of sequencing methods for studying alternative isoforms. This has really been an area of development over the years. Um, people have been interested in understanding the structure of uh, mRNAs in human and other species for many, many years. Um, once the genome was sequenced, we had this in human, this amazing reference sequence to work with. Uh, but then uh, going from that to what transcripts are actually expressed and what their exact structures are it was also a big task. Uh, initially, a lot of the, the heavy lifting was done by uh, full-length uh, cDNA sequencing. And this is really the gold standard for resolving the structure of mRNA. So if you can isolate a full-length cDNA, clone it, and then sequence that entire cDNA across the entire uh, insert sequence, you really can tell with exquisite accuracy um, what the exact structure of a messenger RNA is by then mapping that complete sequence back to the reference genome and seeing where the exons and introns wind up. <coughs> uh, unfortunately, this is still really low throughput uh, activity, if we, but if we could just somehow magically sequence full-length cDNAs, we would probably not do RNA-seq the way we do it. If we didn't have to fragment our cDNA into all these little pieces and then kind of shotgun sequence them and try to put the pieces back together after the fact, the analysis would be way, way simpler. Uh, so one of the sort of dreams of uh, the sort of next, next-gen sequencing is uh, nanopore sequencing where one could imagine uh, feeding RNAs through a pore and reading the sequence off as those RNAs are fed through that pore and not having to fragment the RNA, so we would just read the sequence off uh, from the beginning to the end, and we would do that millions and millions of times, and we would get both quantification and the complete structure of every RNA uh, that was in your uh, sample. But we're just definitely not there right now. Um, and we've kind of gone through these stages of low throughput full-length cDNA sequencing, and then to try to get at uh, uh, cDNAs that were missing, there was sort of targeted ORC sequencing where we designed primers to amplify uh, and then we sequenced many products from those amplifications to try to identify alternative splice patterns. Uh, a lot of EST sequencing was done where we generated cDNA clones in a high throughput <laughs> fashion and then just sequenced the ends of those in a fairly roboticized way uh, and were able to accrue a lot of data. And these top three things are really where the bulk of the 
annotation of the transcriptome that we're using today comes from. So most of the transcripts that you're seeing in Ensemble or RefSeq came from these projects where teams of people running robots were sequencing full-length cDNAs and ESTs. And that data quality is really high, but it's incredibly slow and expensive to produce on even one sample or a series of samples, so it's very difficult to do uh, functional biology with those kind of platforms because we just can't afford to go back and do it for our two conditions of interest or drug treated versus untreated or uh, all of the tissues of an individual or a particular tumor or whatever. So then we moved into a stage where there was much more uh, cost effective and high throughput methods for getting at this kind of uh, information. Uh, so there was a, a variety of really small t uh, tag sequence based approaches where we uh, have some kind of enzymatic approach that gathers little pieces of RNAs, concatenates them together, and then allows us to sequence uh, dozens or hundreds of these little tags at once. Uh, so some of these are SAGE, CAGE, and GIS, and those basically differ uh, in terms of whether they go after the three prime end of transcripts or capture the five prime end of transcripts or the five prime and the three prime end of transcripts. Uh, and those, are, those methods are really good for looking at alternative transcript initiation and alternative polyadenylation sites. Uh, and then uh, shortly after those technologies became uh, well established, the sort of next gen sequencing instruments arrived on the scene. First there was 454 and then there was Selecta which is now called Illumina and now there's also Ion Torrent and there are other platforms being developed. And these really took it to the next level in terms of data throughputs. So we're able to sequence, uh, basically shotgun sequence all of the RNA in a particular sample. Uh, and produce an amount of data that is completely dwarfs the scale of the data production that we could do just a few years before. Uh, the only downside really is the size of the molecules that we're sequencing. So we're still limited to these paired 100 MERS uh, and we're gradually increasing that size and some people who are really interested in alternative splicing will use a different sequencing strategy where they sequence uh, single end 300 MERS or they try to do paired 250 MERS, so pushing the limits of the Illumina platform to get longer reads so that you can do a better job of resolving where the exon and intron boundaries are and you don't have to do so much inference, so much piecing all these little pieces of the puzzle together to get your full length isoform prediction. <laughs> and it's this kind of data that Cufflinks is really meant for. Uh, so it was really designed with these short sequences in mind and all of the sort of mathematical wizardry of it is about trying to uh, make these inferences and piece together all these pieces and try to predict what the full length isoforms really look like. And there's a simple uh, depiction here uh, which is actually a very simple scenario relative to what is happening at most uh, in most human genes but even this very simplified sort of uh, toy example uh, gets very complicated when you start to really think about what's going on. Uh, so what's shown at the top here, this is from the Cufflinks manuscript, uh, are three hypothetical transcripts. Uh, the first two uh, share the same transcription start site and the third one has a different transcription start site. Uh, and then they also differ in different ways. So uh, two of them uh, share the same uh, three prime exon. Uh, the first one has this distinct uh, exon that's being skipped in the second one and so forth, so on. So there's all these little subtle differences between these three, but they also share certain features. And I don't know if we've talked about this before, but this is a very common depiction where you have a transcript that's uh, drawn with sort of a narrow rectangle and then a wider rectangle. Uh, and usually what that's indicating is the portion of the transcript that is coding, so the portion that becomes translated into protein. Uh, and then the narrow part is the, in this case, the five prime UTR, then the coding portion, and then the three prime UTR at the right hand side here. Uh, so you can also think about in each of these isoforms, what would the open reading frame or protein coding portion look like? So you can see that B and C uh, share the same uh, short open reading frame here, and A has a different uh, coding sequence. A and B share the same promoter sequence, and C has a different. Uh, and so forth. So you've got all these different ways you can think about how the, these isoforms are different or similar to each other. Uh, and the first thing Cufflinks does is try to estimate the relative abundance of each of these three isoforms. And then in the sort of splicing uh, analysis component of Cufflinks, it tries to break down 
the isoforms into these different categories. So for example, it will compare within the transcription splicing group. So it divides your samples into those that have uh, transcriptions uh, <coughs> start site one, and then it looks just within those uh, how well expressed there are. So we have two uh, isoforms, the blue and the yellow here, sorry, <coughs> the blue and the yellow that uh, share the same transcription start site. So we can ask for that transcription start site, how do those two isoforms how do those, the expression of those two isoforms differ? And then when we're doing differential analysis between our two conditions, we can look at the ratio between those two isoforms that use the same transcription start site uh, in condition A versus condition B. Similarly, we can now look at uh, differential promoter usage. So in this case, binning the, the isoforms that, ha that share the same transcription start site, so A and B both use this transcription start site, uh, and C uses the second transcription start site. Uh, so basically kind of pooling the data from A and B and comparing them to C. Uh, and then again, in our differential scenario, we would look at the ratio of uh, use of transcription start site one to transcription start site two in our first condition and our second condition. Uh, and then finally, you can do a similar kind of thing with the uh, coding sequence. So maybe what we really care about is the expression of isoforms that have a particular predicted uh, open reading frame or protein sequence. So in that case, we would bin isoforms B and C together because they share the same protein coding uh, section, and A is what has a different protein coding uh, section. <coughs> so in that case, we would compare A to B and C, and in our differential analysis, we would look at the ratio of B plus C to A in condition A and B. So that's like a very bewildering amount of numbers and letters. Um, but all of this ties back to the output that we're going to get from Cufflinks when we run it in this sort of splicing mode, where we look at the files that are really aimed at uh, investigating splicing. So this first scenario, this the output that corresponds to these kinds of comparisons is going to be in this file called splicing.diff. Uh, and then when we're looking at the usage of different transcription start sites, that output will be in the promoters.diff. Uh, and then we're really focusing on the differential uh, expression of uh, coding sequences that'll be in this cds.diff file. Any questions on that? Yeah. So we've been gradually working our way through this uh, flow chart of the different steps. <coughs> what we're going to do now is actually kind of circle back uh, to what we've done before. We're going to go back to running Cufflinks, but we're going to change up the options. So Cufflinks has many, many options, and you can run it in different modes with different goals in mind. So it's sort of multiple tools built into one. Uh, but we're going to do a sort of similar pattern where we do a transcript compilation with Cufflinks, uh, and then we're going to merge our transcripts together and compare them to known transcripts. Uh, and then we're going to use Cufdiff except in the, instead of just doing simple differential express gene expression, we're going to do uh, differential splicing analysis or alternative expression analysis. Uh, so before we go on, I just had this slide that's sort of uh, randomly thrown in here that we, uh, I thought we would just address this because this is a question that has come up a few times already here and it comes up every time we talk to any crowd of people doing RNA-seq analysis. Uh, and that's sort of the question of what, what do I do if I don't have a reference genome for my species? Um, and the bottom line is that we don't really have time to, to get into a lot of the details of that. You really have to take different anal analytical approaches. Um, but one of the things that I often uh, ask people to consider is wh why don't they have a reference genome? Uh, so, and in some cases, are you sure you don't have a reference genome? Uh, and the purpose of that question is just to sort of explore the idea of, um, in some way, in some cases, genome sequencing has actually become quite cheap. Uh, and if you're really struggling to do RNA seq analysis without a reference genome, and it actually might not be that hard to generate the reference genome for your uh, bizarre critter that only you and five other people in the world are studying, um, the whole g genome and assembly analysis uh, methods have really come a long way. Uh, and it may actually be cost-effective and a reasonable place to start to actually try to build your own reference genome. Uh, sort of a rela related piece to that is that a really, actually a bad reference genome is no better than none at all. 
um, and you, there's nothing stopping you from doing a reference-free analysis. Uh, but if you can quickly and relatively cheaply produce some kind of reference genome by sequencing the DNA of your species, um, you should think about doing that. Now, there are some, definitely some legitimate reasons why you may not already have a reference genome and why making it might be impractical. Some of the common reasons that we uh, hear are the genome of my species is too large or too complex. So this is something that the plant people often have to deal with, where they have these just truly massive genomes that are hexaploid or worse. Uh, and it really probably would be quite computationally uh, expensive and difficult to produce even a bad reference genome. Uh, another place where you see this is metagenomics, so where you're actually not studying, you don't actually know what is in your sample. There are multiple species and they're all mixed together in the same sample. So there isn't really this simple concept of, oh, I have a human cell line, therefore I'm going to compare it to the human reference genome sequence, or I know it's a mouse because I can see the mouse in the cage and then I kill the mouse and I get its DNA. Uh, it's a very different situation from I isolated RNA from a gut sample from, you know, someone. Uh, after they ate some Mexican food or something, whatever your experiment is. <clears throat> uh, so it might not be practical. Um, but basically, the, the, one of the answers to what you do if you don't have a reference genome uh, is to do transcriptome assembly, which will work uh, without having a reference genome. Uh, the bad news is that de novo transcriptome assembly is, is but it's beyond the scope of this workshop, and the reason, one of the reasons for that is it's fairly complex, and the tools that do this are quite elaborate. Uh, but the good news is that there's a lot of commonalities between running one bioinformatics tool suite and another. So a lot of the sort of basic skills that you learn here would be applicable to installing a transcriptome assembler and gathering input files and running a series of commands and then filtering the output, dealing with the output files and so forth. Um, if you go to this, uh, this link, you'll probably have an updated version of this even by now. Uh, there's a couple de novo genome-based uh, uh, assemblers there uh, and a variety of other uh, de novo transcriptome assembly uh, programs. The ones that I'm most familiar with are um, Transibis and Trinity. Uh, and I've had heard very good things about both of those. I've been involved in some projects that involve Transibis uh, in Vancouver and they yielded very uh, good results. Uh, the, problem, the thing that I've heard about Transibis that really detracts from it is that it's, uh, it's difficult to install, difficult to run. There sort of well, seems to be some black magic to getting it to run. And I haven't seen a lot of success stories for people outside of the group that developed it actually using it, uh, which is obviously not good. Uh, Trinity, the, Trinity, though, I have seen uh, a lot more use just in the community. So people just picking it up and using it um, and there's a, a course in Cold Spring Harbor in the fall uh, that has an RNAC component where they, they walk you through the process of doing analysis uh, of RNA-seq data with Trinity. Uh, and it's, I've seen that a few times and it seemed to go fairly smoothly. So I guess if I had to recommend one tool that you might check out first, I guess that would be my, my recommendation. <coughs> this is developed at the Broad uh, Trinity. Okay, so as usual, we're going to now uh, switch over to a few slides about the tutorial itself, and then we're going to dive into the tutorial, and that will be the last tutorial of the day. Uh, and we're doing uh, pretty good for time, uh, so we may uh, even be able to end a little bit early and then be able to spend some time uh, talking to each of you about uh, particular questions you had uh, or uh, challenges you have with your own experiments and so forth. <clears throat> and do the survey. Spend a lot of time really thinking hard about the survey. Um, you can do that too. So the learning objectives of this tutorial, uh, we're going to run Cufflinks again, but now we're going to learn how to run it in what we call reference only mode. Well, that's, so that's what we've already learned. We're going to extend our, our use of it to the reference guided mode and to the de novo modes. So remember, this is where we use uh, our GTF file to guide uh, cufflinks instead of really forcing it to consider those transcripts and no others. Uh, and then de, de novo mode is where we, we don't tell it anything about what the transcripts look like, and we just tell cufflinks to tell us what the transcripts look like without any cheating or hints. Um, and that's really making you know, quite a demand of, of cufflinks. 
Uh, then we're going to learn how to use cuff merge to combine transcriptomes from multiple cufflinks runs. So we're going to run cufflinks on each of our samples, our two uh, normal replicates in quotations and our two tumor replicates. Uh, and then we're going to combine the transcriptomes that come out of that, those four runs to give us sort of a common reference point so that we can get, then go back and develop a unified set of expression estimates across the four samples. Uh, then we're going to learn how to perform differential splicing analysis with cuff diff. So this is basically going to involve running cuff diff uh, on the output from cufflinks um, where cufflinks was being run in uh, sort of splicing aware or splicing tailored modes. Uh, we're also going to go back actually a little bit further and take a, a closer look at the top hat junctions fi counts file um, and also dig into some of the cuff cufflinks differential splicing files at the command line. So this top hat junctions file is actually can be quite uh, revealing. Uh, I'd mentioned it uh, earlier I think in the first lecture uh, where you can use uh, summaries of how many reads span across junctions to get a sense of the quality of your library. Uh, another thing that you can do is just take this junctions file that comes out of Top Hat and look for particular interesting splicing events. So this is a much more sort of segmented or focused analysis where cufflinks hasn't been run yet. All you've done is align your reads to the genome and some of them have spanned across introns that represent exon exon junctions. Uh, and this junctions file is automatically produced to summarize how many reads spanned across each junction. So you basically get a readout of every connection between two exons that was observed in the transcriptome that you, that you sequenced in your RNA-seq experiment. And you can use that to identify interesting splicing events. You don't necessarily know, know what the whole transcript looks like, but you can still use it to find candidate uh, alternative splicing events. And then once you find those candidates, you could sort of back up and say, well, what gene are, is there? What might this isoform look like? Uh, and it's sort of a very uh, quick and focused way to look at the splicing output uh, in your RNA-seq experiment without even having to run cufflinks. And you can visualize these, this file in uh, IGV, uh, and it can be quite revealing just on its own. <coughs> uh, and that's what we're going to do. So we're going to visualize this junction, top hat junction count file in IGV and also the assembled transcripts that come out of cufflinks uh, when we run in reference guided and de novo mode. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is start, start rerunning cufflinks in rough guided and de novo mode. As I said, in the first, in module three, we were running cufflinks in this reference only mode. Uh, and the nice thing about the reference only mode is that it gives you a kind of a simple output. You get one estimate for every transcript that you fed into the tool, which is kind of nice. You get this sort of microarray style output. I know I have 25,000 transcripts and I've got these 10 samples and I just want a readout that uh, ten, has 10 columns, one for each sample, and it's got 25,000 rows, one for each known isoform. Uh, and you can really quickly get into differential expression analysis without uh, having to do a lot of complicated downstream processing of files. So it gives you this really like microarray style output. Uh, but that's really an underutilization of the sort of richness of RNA-seq data. So we're going to try to do a better job of, of taking advantage of that richness now. So in order to do that, we're going to play around these options. So we're going to talk a lot more about these the dash G, dash little g, and dash big G uh, options in both top hat and cufflinks and cuff diff, uh, and it gets a bit confusing because they, you know, these, the same letter uh, keeps getting used over again in slightly different but related contexts. Uh, so just to review them uh, now and then we'll do them again, do this again when we're actually running the commands. Uh, so top hat has a, a dash big G or GTF option, and this is, remember, is used to supply the transcriptome GTF file during the alignment. So we're not trying to assemble transcripts, but we're trying to help the aligner uh, do the best job it can figuring out where every read should go in the reference genome, uh, and we're allowing it to use the transcriptome as a guide for that. So this is totally independent of what you do in the downstream step with cufflinks. So you might decide to, to use the GTF file when you're doing your alignment at, or not, and then as an independent choice, when you're running cufflinks, you might decide to use uh, the GTF file to basically force cufflinks to give you estimates for those transcripts or use it as a guide 
or not use it uh, in the de novo mode, or some combination of these things. Uh, so just to maximize the confusion, uh, Top Hat has both a big G and a small g, uh, and in this case, the small g is really sort of an unrelated option that's used to specify the maximum number of multiple mappings for a single gene, and I don't know why they chose g for that. They probably should have chosen something else, but that option we're not really doing anything with. But we did use the, the big G option to, to give the GTF file to Top Hat and to, to tell it to use that information. Now Cufflinks has a big G option, and this is used again to supply our transcriptome GTF, and if you specify dash G with a transcriptome GTF file, Cufflinks is going to quantitate against that re those reference transcript annotations, and that's what we've been calling the reference only mode. That's what we did already. So big, big, big G is what we did in the, in the module three. Now we're going to switch to using the little g option. Again, you supply the same GTF file, transcriptome GTF file that we've been using, uh, but this time it's going to use that to guide the assembly uh, rather than really like being strict about uh, what transcripts uh, are being used. And this is what we're going to call the, the reference guided analysis mode. And then if you run cufflinks without the big G or the little g, um, this is what we're going to call de novo analysis mode. So there's no GTF file even being specified. And then finally, cufdiff, it requires a GTF file, uh, but it is not specified with a big G or a little g option. It's simply supplied as a path when you're constructing your, your cufdiff command. So I mentioned this. So I realize that's very confusing. We're going to go over it again when we're running each of these commands. Uh, we're going to go over the, this uh, top hat junctions bed file as well at the command line, but just to give you a, sort of a brief introduction of what I mean by junctions. So after our alignments, you get top hat creates a summary of all the reads that happen to have supported exon exon junctions or spanned across an intron. Uh, so for example, you, you might get a readout that says for a particular gene that exon 1, 2 has five reads and a connection of exon 1 to 3 has nine reads. So this exon 1, 3 is sort of implying that an exon 2 was skipped. So this is sort of exon skipping uh, junction. Uh, and this file just has a very simple format, uh, and it reports uh, all of the unique exon-exon junctions. So every line in it is a, a unique coordinate combina combination, and then the fifth column uh, simply contains the junction read counts, the number of reads that supported that exon-exon junction. And this is what it looks like. What it looks like if we view this file. Uh, in IGV. You get uh, these sort of uh, arc, little red arcs that span across uh, exon exon junctions. So for example, the one that's being shown here is going from exon 1 to exon 2. That's what this arc is here. Uh, and then 2 to 3 and 3 to 4 and so forth. Uh, and then the sort of darkness or thickness of this arc is a re representative of how many uh, reads supported that. Uh, so you could also view the, the individual reads by loading your BAM file, and you could see that the, all of the individual reads that supported this junction, and you could start to correlate how the increasing number of those gives you a sort of a fatter arc, and less of them gives you a sort of thinner arc. Um, a quick introduction to cuff merge. So I think we've already used cuff merge uh, a few times, but basically the idea here is that it combines transcripts predicted from multiple RNA-seq data sets into one view of the transcriptome. Uh, and we run this uh, before running cuff diff so that we can compare across multiple conditions uh, and have a sort of a unified reference set to compare to. Uh, and then you can also ask cuff merge to simultaneously compare transcripts to our known transcript GTF file from Ensemble. So when we run trans, uh, cuff, cuff li cufflinks in the fully de novo mode, we're going to predict potentially novel transcripts from each of our four samples. And then we're going to run cuff merge to merge those together into sort of a unified transcript dome, but it's still totally predicted. We don't really know how it relates to what we, the known transcripts from humans. So when we run a cuff merge, we can also say, uh, here Now, at the end of everything, here is our known GTF file. Just tell me how the transcripts you predicted correlate with what was known about the transcript dome. 
Uh, but now that the, the assembly is all done, so it's not going to influence what transcripts get assembled or don't get assembled. It's just a sort of annotation after the fact. Um, this is a simple comparison of merge GTFs from each cufflinks mode. So just to give you sort of a visual example of some of the results, um, what's shown on the top here are is a track of UCSC genes, uh, and then we're seeing output from cufflinks being run in three different modes here, one, two, three, uh, and then this is the ensemble gene track uh, that would correspond to our GTF file. Uh, so you can see a number of things are going on here. First, UCSC and ensemble don't agree about what genes or transcripts are expressed at this region of the genome. So you can see UCSC has a single gene here, and Ensemble has one, two, three. Uh, and then in, when we ran cufflinks, um, we got transcripts that appear to correspond to the known Ensemble transcripts. But when we ran in both the reference guided mode and the de novo mode, we've now predicted uh, a novel transcript that doesn't appear to correspond to any of the genes uh, in either Ensemble or UCSC. So that's potentially a novel gene that's been predicted for, straight from our RNA-seq data. Any questions on that? Is it possible to um, infer false positives from that data? Infer false positives. As in, you've got a predicted gene, but it probably doesn't exist. Yeah, so you don't need, you don't definitely don't know that it's real just yeah. because it was predicted. It, yeah. it could be a false positive, um, but the question is, can you actually how do you know from the data whether it is a false positive or if it's real, or if you need to go through and do a later analysis? There are definitely pieces of information that might, might make you more or less confident about it being real. So one thing you could do is look, sort of cast the net wider in terms of what other types of data you compare to. So in that case, I was comparing to UCSC and Ensemble, but there are many, many other transcriptome databases out there that you could compare to. So you could say, well, there's some evidence from some prior experiments or from DBEST or libraries of cDNA sequences. There might be also other, other things also about the, the nature of the sequence itself that made it more or less believable. So, if, for example, if it looks like it's in a region that would be difficult to align to, like, say, a repetitive element, um, that might make it more likely to be just the result of a mapping artifact. Um, and there's also sort of a, a built-in prior uh, based on what species you're working with and how well annotated that species is. So for something like human, it really has been pretty heavily annotated. So you, I think you need to just inherently be a little bit more skeptical or suspect about the prediction of novel genes because there is sort of a question of, well, how come it hasn't been found so far when we've been looking for these things so exhaustively for so long? Whereas if you're dealing with some species that there's hardly any annotation at all, you might expect plenty of novel transcripts to be found and for quite a number of those to actually be real. Um, I would also say that transcripts that are multi-exon, that have good coverage, uh, that are longer, those things are less likely to just be artifacts of mapping, uh, whereas small single exon, just like a block of reads aligns here and then cufflinks is like, oh, that looks like a transcript there. Those things are probably more likely to be false positives than oh, I found this thing that's 1.5 KB long and it's got tens of thousands of reads of support and there's five exons and four introns. Like, it really looks like a transcript. It just doesn't line up with uh, other known transcripts. So there are a bunch of things like that that you can do at the informatic level. Uh, but then, of course, you would want to definitely validate it by some orthogonal uh, approach. Uh, but the nice thing is that cufflinks uh, really gives you what you would need to design that validation experiment. I mean, you basically have a prediction. The sequence looks like this. Uh, so it's fairly straightforward to go back to your sample and say, try to amplify that cDNA, clone it, um, see what, 
whether you can actually rescue that. Uh, this is sort of a similar idea, but um, this is where we've merged uh, our GTFs uh, from each sample. Um, again, showing the reference only in de novo mode. Uh, so in this case, we've got, uh, in the reference only mode, we're just seeing one transcript being summarized by cufflinks because that's what we told it to do by saying do this in reference only mode. Uh, and then in de novo mode, we're seeing at the same uh, locus a lot of different uh, transcripts being predicted. And each of them is very, very, very similar, but they have sort of subtle differences. Uh, so for example, you can see that this one here has a retained intron. Uh, and this isoform uh, has a predicted uh, alternative transcript initiation uh, start site and a, a slightly longer uh, exon than what is used in these other isoforms, uh, and so on. And this is typical that isoforms that are predicted are usually very similar to each other and they have some subtle distinctive difference. Yes? So, in the slide before, it looks like we're and over the same. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, I'm not showing it here, and I, I don't remember, because this is just a screenshot that I took at some point while I was exploring the data. Um, but we're going to look at them side by side, so you'll start to get a sense of how much they differ and how much they vary. Um, depending on what data you use, they might differ quite a lot, or they might uh, be very similar. Um, and it will also depend, again, to, on the reference transcriptome that you supply when you're doing the reference guided mode. Uh, if it's really complete, that'll, it'll have a bigger influence than one that was quite incomplete. Um, and generally just the cleanness of the data. I think if, there, if your data is noisy or you have a lot of misalignments, then you might tend to get more sort of false predictions. Um, but I think generally the authors, if you just ask them, like, I just want to run this software in one mode, I don't want all these different modes. I want to kind of simplify the analysis, but I want to do splicing analysis. They will generally recommend that you use the reference guided mode, um, although I think that's changed over time. And they did publish, I think one of the, on the wiki, there's uh, some of the papers that are listed there uh, are sort of follow-up papers by the authors of these suites of tools, and one of them is uh, sort of another sort of published tutorial that sort of best practices for using the tuxedo suite, and it will describe uh, this, like which modes they think are appropriate for what types of goals. Oh, and that's actually related to this next slide. Uh, so what if you return to your lab and you can't get to work on your own data? Uh, so obviously one thing you can do is refer to the materials that we provided with this course. So we're really kind of giving you a, a bit of a survey of a lot of these materials, and there's a lot of detail there that we're uh, having to uh, breeze past at times. Uh, if you go back, there may be additional sort of annotation in the tutorial files that we didn't ex expressly cover or that kind of flew by and it didn't sink in at the time. So you might just find the answer just by going back. Uh, and then there's this Nature Protocols tutorial that Cole Trapnell wrote, uh, and it provides actually a, a troubleshooting guide, um, which I have on the next slide that explains some sort of common problems that come up when you're doing this kind of analysis. So you can check uh, for resources like that. I've already mentioned searching BioStars and Seek Answers, and of course there's always Google for every problem that you might have. Uh, if your question's not already on BioStars, please ask it. Uh, it's just a good way to sort of get the question out there, and, and you never know, you might get a great answer. Uh, and then if you pursue the problem further, so this is sort of a, a best practice for these question and answer forums, is that if you, if you find the answer, please come back and, and tell us at BioStars. Uh, about what you discovered, because uh, before too long you'll be the expert, not the people on BioStars. <coughs> so here's this troubleshooting guide. Uh, it kind of reviews some common problems that people have when using uh, Top Hat cufflinks and cuff diff. Uh, so for example, the first one is uh, Top Hat cannot find bow tie or SAM tools, uh, and the possible reason is that you've got your path variable uh, set incorrectly. Uh, so remember, we went through this exercise of setting our path variable to tell Top Hat and basically tell Linux where to find Bowtie, Top Hat, Sam tools, and so forth. Uh, and I'll just I'll leave the, those extra uh, problems for you to refer to on your own time. 